Howdy, everyone. Chuck here on a Saturday, bringing you another fine selection from our back catalog. Is yogurt a miracle food? This is from November 2018, and uh, you know, yogurt's pretty good for you, you guys. It's something you should be eating. Uh, perhaps even a miracle food. Do we answer that question? Is yogurt a miracle food? Perhaps. Listen in and find out right now. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W., Chuck Bryant, and Jerry, and this is the smooth, creamy, tangy edition of Stuff You Should <laughs> Know. Fruit on the bottom. Ugh. You don't like yogurt or fruit on the bottom yogurt? I don't like fruit on the bottom. Oh, okay. But I you do like yogurt. Yeah, I don't like any of the, the fruity ones. Mm-hmm. I mean, they taste fine, mm-hmm. but I think they're just like loaded with sugar generally and sweeteners and things. Well, yeah, it's not fruit. It's like jam on the bottom. <laughs> Jelly, you know? Do you like Com- yogurt? Compote. Yeah, I love yogurt. As a matter of fact, while we were researching this, I was like, I, I can't. I can't stand it any longer. I got up and got some yogurt. Do you eat it regularly? Uh, not as much as I should, although I recently did a blood test and my protein was low, strangely, so I'm going to start eating more. Okay. <laughs> what? I was just You're like, you sounded like, yeah, I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just curious what your yogurt intake was. What about you? You eat it every day? No, I should. Like, I don't eat yogurt much. I'm constantly slapping it on my kid's baby plate. Mm-hmm. And she loves it, and mm-hmm. Emily eats it, and I'm mm-hmm. like, I need to eat more yogurt. I mean, I like it. I just don't think about it much. Yeah. What I do is sometimes in a, like a hotel or anywhere where they have the sort of build your own parfait thing. Yes. Throw a little granola. Yeah. Or granula in there. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of fresh fruit and mix that all up, and I love it. And I'm like, I should do this every day because, as we will find out, uh, the benefits of eating yogurt, which are sort of up in the air as far as like hard facts Mm -hmm. but it seems like sort of regularly eating yogurt is kind of one of the keys to getting the health benefits that's that seems to be generally agreed upon and not like uh, oh i ate yogurt today that means i'm (laughs) eight percent healthier right yeah that's not that's not how it works yeah although i think it is like just temporarily you're doing better for a second than you were before but you know whatever yeah let me give you a hint buddy Find a local beekeeper, and I mean local, like f- no more than five, six miles from your house. Okay. Got one. Okay, great. Take a little of that honey, drizzle it on some nice full-fat Greek yogurt. Mm-hmm. Sit back and enjoy. You will be, that's all you need. That's it. If you want to add some other stuff, like some sliced almonds or whatever on it, that's fine too, or fruit and granola. I find really good raw local honey and, and Greek yogurt, it's just like you're eating health. Yeah. Is what it feels like. Yeah. I mean, I like the taste on its own. Yeah. But you get the, you know, health benefits from that honey too. You do. Yeah. I mean, throw some uh throw some broccoli in there. Throw a little broccoli in there, <laughs> a Tonka truck. <laughs> anything you can find. Just Those put it onto your yogurt and start eating. <laughs> and we covered uh we covered some of this stuff in our uh probiotics cast. Yeah, a lot. From uh how many years ago was that? Four two thousand fourteen. Okay, four years ago. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I felt like yogurt li- deserved to live on its own. I was incredulous at first, but I, I came <laughs> around, actually. I, I, I was like, Chuck's right. So uh, let's get into it. Um, I guess we should talk history. Yes. Because yogurt is one of those kind of great accidental discoveries uh, that, that came from many, many years ago, kind of like a beer and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Because people... You know, they they think it's pretty clear that at some point, many thousands of years ago in the mm-hmm. Middle East, mm-hmm. people were transporting stuff like milk, maybe like a goat's milk or whatever. Probably goat and sheep first. Yeah, and they were transporting that in whatever disgusting animal bladder or whatever they used right. to transport liquids and things like that. Mm-hmm. They got there and they were like, ah, this stuff is turned. It's it's It stinks. It's thick. Um, but, you know— we're uh, <laughs> it's it's a thousand years from being uh, from being civilized humanity. So 
let's just try this stuff. <laughs> right. Like who's gonna who's gonna care or know? Somebody clark me some honey. <laughs> yeah. So they clarked themselves a little honey. Mm-hmm. They ate a little bit of it. It was you know thicker now and it had this kind of sour tangy taste. Yeah. And one of those ancient Middle Eastern people said, "Hey, this is not bad." Right. <laughs> And I think uh, there's this guy named um, Adam Maskovich who wrote a post on the salt um, that who basically said it's not an it's not entirely an understatement to say like civilization was in part built on yogurt. That was pretty neat. It really was because so all of a sudden you have milk and everybody at the time was like uh, I can feed this to my kid but I can't I can't keep milk down I poop all over my saddle basically while we're out riding um, because this is the Mongolian steppes right um, but I have found that this weird tangy version uh, the sour version of milk that you call yogurt. Like, I, that doesn't affect me at all. It's the weirdest thing. And so as more people were able to eat this stuff, which is full of nutrients, lots of calories, and has a tantalizing taste, uh, people kind of gathered around the areas that had yogurt and other stuff too, he points out, like sure. cheese and things like that and bread and beer. It's possible beer was the real reason that civilization was started. Um, but the the... the, the Yogurt played no small role in that. It, in its fermentation, it is transformed for, as something from something that people who are lactose intolerant can't take to something that people who are lactose intolerant can actually eat and benefit from. Yeah, so they had that conversation, and at the end of it, one of them said, also, is it weird that we're humans and we're drinking animal milk as mm-hmm. adults? And they all went, don't worry about that. Yeah, they said, stop thinking yourself as more than an animal. You're an animal. <laughs> Animal. So <laughs> um, it really thrived uh, in the Middle East. They they love the stuff like you were talking about. Um, it's actually a Turkish word, yogurt is. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took a little bit longer to catch up to uh, Europe. Um, I think at the end of the 19th century is really when it started to spread wide in Europe. And then and here in the United States, it took to like the middle half of the 20th century when it was mass marketed by Dannon mm-hmm. for, and it's not like we didn't eat yogurt at all, but definitely not like, it, I mean, in the Middle East, it was, it's not like, oh, we'll just eat some of this for breakfast with fruit. I mean, it's in a lot of great, great dishes mm-hmm. and dips and sauces and is, is kind of one of the staples of a lot of Middle Eastern food. So yeah. they, they're doing it right. Yeah, and so the Middle East seems to be the, the home of yogurt. It, it was the home of civilization, and they think that yogurt's as old as civilization, maybe a little older. Um, and Turkey seems to be some sort of like kind of fulcrum for the spread of yogurt throughout the world. Yeah. And in fact, the word yogurt is a Turkish word. It comes from yogurt mak, which is Turkish me- meaning to thicken. And Turkey, the fact that we in the English-speaking world call it yogurt— suggests that it was the Turks who introduced the the West to yogurt. But they're also pretty sure that um, Turkey was the ones who introduced yogurt to India as well. And the neighbors, the neighboring areas around Turkey, like Bulgaria, Georgia, um, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Iran, like all these areas are pretty famous for eating a lot of yogurt and even having their own kind of yogurt. Um, or their own version of it, but something about Turkey really seems to be the the like the pivot point for the spread of yogurt in the world. Yeah, and I can't find. Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, even today, it says that uh, Turkish people eat about, and this was like four or five years ago, mm-hmm. uh, two hundred and eighty-two cups of yogurt per person per year which is definitely more than in the United States. Well, it was at the time. We have since caught up quite uh, quite a bit. I think, yeah, I think that stat for us is poundage though, right? Yes. How many pounds of yogurt do we eat? <laughs> so we ate 4.8 billion pounds of yogurt in 2017. What? 4.8 billion pounds in the United States alone. And yeah, we're not like the, the, the highest yogurt eating... Um, civilization on the planet by far. But that's like about th- the 15 pounds per person. Or oh, no, thir- 13.7 pounds per person. Um, 
which it, really it sounds like a lot, but yogurt weighs a lot. So it's actually just 36 servings per person per year in the United States. Wow. So that's, yeah, in Turkey, 282 cups. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. So, Chuck, like you were saying, like yogurt didn't really make its way over to the States until the 20th century, right? Yes. And I think it was, and you said it was Dannon that brought it here? That's right, in the Bronx. Yeah, they moved their operations from um, Spain, Barcelona, I think, to the Bronx, which is really weird because, like, America was not a yogurt-eating culture at all. No pun they, intended? Not not really, no. <laughs> but they brought yogurt to a place said, where in the world would be the hardest place to get a foothold business-wise? Let's move our operations there. So they moved it to the Bronx and then just started slowly working on America. And it wasn't until they figured out the fruit on the bottom thing that America said, oh, okay. We like this. It's sweet. It's not some disgusting, tangy, soured milk. We can put like compote and jam in it, and it's good. And that is when it started to take off. And basically, you have Dan and yogurt to thank for bringing yogurt to America. And it wasn't until, what, maybe 2010 or 13 before we finally started to shed like all the extra gunk and actually get into yogurt the way that the rest of the world's been eating it for thousands of years with like what we call Greek yogurt. The way the good Lord intended. That's right. (laughs) You want to take a break? Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we're about to take a break and we're going to come back with more yogurt. All right, so uh, we talked about probiotics in the episode on probiotics. Yeah, it was a good episode, if I remember correctly. It was. So uh, as, a, as a brief recap, uh, probiotics uh, in food, uh, they're like culture concentrates in, in, some, con- in some foods. Uh, sometimes they're in dietary supplements. Uh, sometimes they're in things like uh, yogurt and cheese, uh, fermented dairy products. Mm-hmm. And it's, they're usually bacteria. Uh, sometimes you can uh, yeast can act as a probiotic, but when you generally think probiotic, you think of good bacteria uh, used to ferment milk, um, and then sometimes with things like yogurt, they add in other bacteria on top of that. Right, which is great. Just add some more bacteria, as long as it's the good kind, basically. Yeah, but sometimes they add bacteria that's not considered probiotic, too. Right. I, I looked that up. I couldn't find what they were talking about unless it's actually a probiotic bacteria that just hasn't been shown to be probiotic right. at, this, at this time. Yeah, that's maybe all I, so. That's all I could get from it. So, and with probiotics, just a kind of a quick overview, it's just basically like it's beneficial bacteria that's in your gut. And when you're born, you're not born with your own microbiome. I think you get it from breast milk and you get a coating of it as you exit your mother's vagina, okay? So you you develop it pretty quickly, but it's kind of like gifted to you um, very shortly after birth. Yeah, you build it out. <clears throat> exactly. So um, as, you're, as you age and live, like some stuff dies, some stuff gets pooped out of you, but it's constantly reproducing. But the point of probiotics, whether it's in pill form or whether it is a prebiotic, like a banana, something that can feed probiotic bacteria, or if it's yogurt, is to replenish the bacteria, this good, healthy bacteria that lives in your gut and does all sorts of things from help you produce serotonin that, it, that stabilizes your mood to... Um, digesting your food and moving poop through your intestines faster. All the amazing things. I also want to direct people, we did a microbiome episode, which is one of the all-time most fascinating episodes we ever did. Do you remember that one? The poop cast? No, no. The one that's our microbiome. Oh, right. That that was just on how how completely made up. I think like 90% of our cells are actually not ours. They're they're part of the microbiome of bacteria that live on us and interact with us. And that's what we're, what you're doing when you're eating yogurt is 
bringing in some friends, some reinforcements to the good bacteria. That's the point of probiotics. Yeah. So in order to, um, and we'll get into the the health effects here in a minute, but in order to get that bacteria and have it survive uh, through gastric acid, I mean, it's a it's a inhospitable environment down there mm-hmm. in your gut and in your intestines. Uh, well, first of all, they do think that yogurt might be just a, a good vehicle for that period because it's thick and goopy and it acts like a buffer against that acid. Mm-hmm. But you also have to have a lot of it uh, because a lot of it is going to die off. So there's uh, there are organizations that set minimum standards, and one of them is the National Yogurt Association of the United States. Right. You don't want to mess with them, trust me. <laughs> They'll break your legs it's, just for even looking at them. Yeah, well. they, are, they are tough, tough individuals. They really are, collectively. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I believe the requirement is 100 million bacteria per gram mm-hmm. uh, if you want to have that seal on it. And this is if, if you want to eat yogurt, I mean, if you want to just go get a stick of yogurt and shove it down your throat and get a sugar rush, sure. have at it. Sure. But if you actually want that live and active culture seal stamped on your yogurt, uh, then you're going to have to have 100 million bacteria per gram. Right. And it has to be specific bacteria, too. The FDA decreed in 1981 that if you're going to sell something in the U.S. as yogurt, it has to contain Lactobacillus bulgaricus and Streptococcus thermophilus. We'll talk a little more about those later, but you have to have those, and then you have to have them in amounts of at least 100 million individual bacterium of those strains per gram of yogurt, or else, buddy, that ain't yogurt. That ain't yogurt. That ain't your mom's yogurt. That ain't your dad's yogurt. (laughs) It's nobody's yogurt. No. Not, not as far as the FDA is concerned. And if you thought the uh, National Yogurt uh, Association was tough, boy, howdy, the FDA will mess you up. <laughs> uh, so you want to talk a little bit about how they make yogurt? Yes, but first, get this. So you know you were talking about how how yogurt uh, or bacteria, can some can survive in the gut, which can be inhospitable. Mm-hmm. I was like, how? How did they do that? Some are just coated in like a polysaccharide. That's fine. That's boring. But some bacteria actually have pumps that are designed to pump acid out of the bacteria. So when it's floating around in this bath of stomach acid and juice and digestive enzymes, it's just pumping it out and keeping it just happy as a lark. But it has like a a mechanism for getting rid of the acid that that should otherwise kill it. I just thought that was fascinating. Man, life sciences. Mm -hmm. What else? What's your other big one? Earth science. Earth science, life science. Just science, basically. Yeah? Yeah, it all floats my boat. What kind of science do you hate? Hmm. (laughs) Psychology? No, I find it fascinating. Okay. I don't know, man. Uh, I don't think I hate any science. Yeah, no, I don't hate any science. (laughs) See their kids? No science is hate-worthy. No, don't hate science. Be like Josh. <laughs> Clark yourself some Josh. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Just spun my head right around. Did you see that? I did. That was strange. Uh, but it is October. It is the month of exorcism. It's the uh, Dancing Headstones best season. <laughs> what was the name of the band? I can't remember. Oh. Man, we could have just buzz marketed that guy so well. All right. When you're making yogurt, like you said, it was... Many, many, many years ago, it was just this curdled milk. And they were like, if you hold your nose tight enough, you can still eat this stuff. And it doesn't really upset your stomach that much. Right. Uh, but if you're going to manufacture yogurt, what you want to do is separate the milk uh, into the cream and the skim. Mm-hmm. And this is automatically going to get a thicker texture going uh, because it's got a lot of fat and uh, it's, evaporate, it's evaporating some of the liquid anyway during this process. Right. But then they might say, you know what, let's add some milk powder or some gelatin. We really need to get this to the good yogurty consistent right. uh, consistency that everybody loves. So now it's pretty thick at this point. And then they pasteurize it. And we should do a show on pasteurization and maybe even homogenization. Okay. Uh, maybe they could go together. I think so, because homogenizing just basically means stirring. Yeah. 
Pasteurization, <laughs> that's a, there's a lot to that, a lot of history and everything. But homogenize, I think they've really churched that up. It's just stirring something. Yeah, to make it more homogenous. Right. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> the word fits perfectly. It really does. Uh, so these high, high temperatures that you get through pasteurization uh, is going to help make it even more thick. But you don't need to, like, blast it at 300 degrees for eight hours or whatever. No, you don't want to do that. It's, it's kind of amazing, actually, that it only takes about 15 seconds at 171 degrees Fahrenheit, mm-hmm. and that'll kill off the bacteria that you don't want there. So you know how both of our schedules are just insane right now? Yes. I was starting to feel a little worn down. Sure. Felt like just the tiniest tickle in my nose. And I was like, no, I'm not having it. <laughs> so I busted out the old neti pot. Yeah. Well, I got the double purified tap water out of my water purifier. And then I put it into a pot and boiled it for five minutes Mm -hmm. and stuck the neti pot in and left it in for another five minutes boiling. (laughs) Then I took that out, boiled more water for five minutes, and then finally after it cooled, I put it through my nose. And I looked it up. I'm like, is that overkill? Is it not enough? (laughs) It's overkill. (laughs) It is overkill. From what I saw, what you really need is to, once the water gets to a boil, something like 99.9999% of any pathogen is dead. Yeah. But the I think, eh, I can't remember who recommends it, maybe the CDC. Somebody recommends at least letting it boil for a minute just to be safe. And then if you're above 2,000 feet over sea level, you want to boil it for three minutes because there's a lower temperature required for boiling at higher altitudes, right? Mm-hmm. So really, it's a, a boil it for a minute is even overkill. But I'm going to stick with my five-minute boiling thing. I still don't boil it at all. Dude, uh, do you know what would happen if you got just the off chance of a brain-eating amoeba in there? No, I know, but I also don't, like, get scared walking around during a lightning storm. I don't either. And I just feel like it's about as unlikely. Okay, all right, well then promise me this. Uh Uh-huh. You will never (laughs) neti pot with water that you just got out of a stagnant creek. Okay. (laughs) All right, is that a deal at least? Sure, but can I still pour that into my open wounds? No. Okay. <laughs> Just steer clear of that water altogether. All right. Fair enough. All right. Uh, all right. So at this point, Josh has boiled his water for 20 minutes. By milk. Let it cool for an hour. Pour, right. Poured it through his nostril system. <laughs> this is how I make yogurt. <laughs> uh, no, after they boil uh, for 15 seconds or heat that mi- milk up for 15 seconds, mm-hmm. um, your your it's it's your cream is separating at that point just naturally from the milk because of the temperature. That's when they stir it or homogenize the milk and create that consistently uh, consistency because you don't want anything that has a consistency of of curdling. No, you don't. So hom- homogenization is just stirring it up so you're breaking up the flat the fat globules so that they're spread evenly throughout the milk, which. It just means it's not lumpy milk. It's smooth, textured milk. And the same thing, I guess, that translates to the yogurt. It makes the yogurt smoother, more consistently smooth because it's homogenized milk that it's made from. Yes. Okay, bam, homogenization. We just did the homogenization episode. (laughs) That could have been a short stuff. It could have. I don't even know if it would have qualified for that. Well, we're going to start releasing one called Shortest Stuff. It's just like 45 seconds long. (laughs) That is our future. Uh, so here's the most important part. You think your yogurt's done, but it's not. Because if you want it to be yogurt, you're going to have to pour some good bacteria back in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is like, it kind of depends on which company you work for, what kind of yogurt they want. But mm-hmm. uh, they're going to select their bacteria accordingly. Dump it in there. Yes. that I mean, this is where the actual, all you have is hot milk up to this point, hot homogenized milk. It's when you add that bacteria in to this warm milk that it starts to happen. And you want to let the milk cool a little bit first because, you know, if it's too hot, it's sure. going to, it's, they're going to die. But when it cools to something like, I think, 115 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, then you can add your bacteria and they're going to start to go to work. And all they're doing is basically fermenting the milk into yogurt. That's it. Yeah, which is why if you're lactose intolerant, you can still tolerate yogurt because that bacteria gets in there, mm-hmm. metabolizes that milk sugar, the lactose, mm-hmm. and and 
poops out lactic acid, and it, it, you can lactic acid is fine on the body. Yeah, so not only, this is just amazing, this is when I started to get jazzed by the yogurt. Not only does it break down lactic a, or lactose into um, other kinds of sugars that are more digestible by the human body, the, these these uh, bacteria actually deposit in your gut when you eat yogurt, they deposit an enzyme that helps you break down the lactose that is found in there. So they break it down themselves, and then they help you break it down too, which is why people who are lactose intolerant can still usually eat yogurt. Yeah. Unless you have a severe lactose allergy. I think it's just intolerance you can usually eat yogurt. Yeah, and remember I talked about myself and my lactose intolerance? Mm-hmm. And like, is it am I lactose intolerant, or should I just not eat a pizza and a pint of ice cream? Right. Uh, it turns out it's B. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? Yeah, man. If I if I eat a reasonable amount of cheese and milk, I'm fine. Uh-huh. Yeah, less farty. Yeah, a lot less farty. Good. The whole world is thanking you, buddy, <laughs> for coming to that, doing that experiment, or at least everyone in this room. So, so pretty amazing that that uh, yogurt deposits an enzyme that helps you break down lactose, right? Yeah. Okay, it gets even more amazing. One of the other things, one of the reasons why pro- why um, people say you should eat yogurt if you need protein is, first of all, it's from milk, so there's tons of protein. Yeah. But secondly, the um, the acids or the bacteria in there actually break down the protein, so it becomes what's called more um, bioavailable. It's easier for your body to take in, which normally your body doesn't have trouble absorbing protein anyway, but if it does... Yogurt's your your guy. But then also, it actually synthesizes some vitamins out of whole cloth. Like, there there may not be a lot of folate found in milk. There's more of it found in yogurt because these bacteria during fermentation produce folate, which is something that you really want and need, especially if you're pregnant. So there's there's just some amazing things going on during the fermentation process from milk to yogurt that makes it its own thing. It's it's much more than just soured milk. It's something, it's like a new thing. Yeah. And the fact that they they found this accidentally from carrying sheep's milk around in some animal skin or animal's stomach uh, 10,000 years ago is just makes it even more fascinating. Yeah, it's awesome. And the fact that you can add fruit on the bottom <laughs> is really the, it's the ice. Boy, Americans love a gimmick, and I think... That was all about the gimmick. I'm sure in some boardroom they were like, it's interactive, it's fun. Actually, I know the story behind that. Interactive and fun is probably the words they used. It was uh, It was actually it was suggested in 1947, I think, by a young guy named Juan Metzger, whose dad was one of the co-founders of Dannon. And he was just a lowly bottle washer at the time. But he suggested that as a way to get Americans to eat it. But at the time, the USDA said, you can't mix anything with dairy products. It's against the law. What? Somehow, Dannon convinced the USDA that, no, no, the fruit's on the bottom, so it's not really mixing. If they put it on the top, the USDA would have said, that's mixing. If they had mixed it, homogenized it, I guess, they would have, they would have considered that mixing. But the fact that it was on the bottom... That is why they got away with it. Somehow, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's like the the Jeopardy being somehow different from the typical quiz show. Right. You know, it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. But they, uh, they USDA went along with it, and that's why it was fruit on the bottom. Interesting. Yeah. And there wasn't like some senator from uh, South Carolina <laughs> that said, you're counting on the good people of America to mix their own fruit? <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> That's I don't even know who good. that was supposed to be. Uh, it sounded like Leonardo DiCaprio and <laughs> Django did. Unchained. He really kinda. did. Like he was the, the senator. Man, that movie, that that whole sister subplot, wasn't even a subplot. That was so strange in that movie. Which, which. Sub- His, remember Leo DiCaprio's like sister arrived or whatever. Oh, yeah. And he was just like, where's my beautiful sister? (laughs) And it was just so over the top and strange. (laughs) And it was never explained, like, are they lovers? Is it, like, what's going on? Yeah. So weird. I love Quentin Tarantino (laughs) stuff, man. I I love hate it. (laughs) Oh, really? I don't hate any bit of it. I love it. Oh, I I think he's far too indulgent these days, but. uh, You didn't like the Hateful Eight, huh? 
Uh, you know, <laughs> I like the first four endings. <laughs> are you are you looking forward to the Manson family one he's doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I go I go see all of them, and I think they're all worthwhile. And they're Tarantino movies, so I kind of just put my tongue in my cheek and laugh no matter what. But what was his best one in your opinion? Oh uh, well, I mean, probably Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction for me. Yeah, yeah. But so don't get me wrong, I, I'm not a hater, but. There's clearly no one in his camp that's like, maybe edit some down. Maybe don't be in the movie. (laughs) (laughs) That'll be the day. That'll be the day. Did you like True Romance? Well, yeah, but he just wrote that. Yeah, but it's obviously his work, even though he didn't direct it. No, I love it. That's one of my faves. That was a good one. I mean, like, who cast Gary Oldman for Uh, that role? Tony Scott, I guess. That's just so bizarre, but I think it was so cool. Sit down, have an egg roll. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good movie. All right. So let's take a break and we mm-hmm. will get to the bottom, the fruit on the bottom, if you will, mm-hmm. about uh, nutrition and how, if that's real or not, right after this. All right, Chuck. Yogurt, nutrish or just delish? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the deal. Uh, yogurt has really caught on in the United States in the last, like, decade, more than ever, largely because it's being touted and sold as a health food. Dude. Big there, time. There are studies that are coming in that says it helps with everything from Reducing obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, respiratory diseases, improves pregnancy outcomes, reduces allergies, um, improves bone health and dental health. Basically anything you can think of, there's been a study that has found that. But from what I'm gathering, either there's not enough studies, which seems not the case to me, or that there are other studies that are finding contradictory Um, evidence to what the pro-yogurt studies are finding. There doesn't seem to be any study that's like, no, no, put the yogurt down, it's going to kill all of us. Nothing like that. But there's, it just seems like the jury's still out on whether it's actually beneficial to you or not, at least over any kind of long term. Yeah, so here's what we know for sure. I mean, just ingredient-wise, especially if you're lactose intolerant, Mm -hmm. you can can get a lot of good calcium from yogurt. that you wouldn't get if, or that you would get if you drank milk or whatever. Uh, but if you're lactose intolerant, you can get it through yogurt. Um, p- vitamin D, protein, potassium, riboflavin. These are all things that are in yogurt that we know are good for you. But it's these, it's like health claims that they're selling people now, which is what we're really talking about here. Uh, like you said, like, will it actually help you lose weight? And there have been some studies that indicate that it could, but it's uh, there are a lot of like caveats attached. It feels like, mm-hmm. like the International Journal of Obesity says that low fat yogurt could help you lose weight, uh, but it's kind of like that's because you're replacing a meal with some yogurt as a substitution, right? Uh, or for a snack, and it's kind of filling. So you're gonna be eating less, and all these things are kind of true, but it's a little misleading. It is, and actually you also want to be careful, like, okay, if you're on a diet and you're using low-fat yogurt to diet with, but you're health conscious, you want to be careful because a lot of the low-fat or no-fat yogurts replace the fat with other stuff like artificial sweeteners like aspartame and saccharin. Mm -hmm. There's usually a lot of sodium in there to try to replace some of the flavor that's lost when you take all the fat out. So there's... There's a lot of push and pull, and yeah, it does seem to be where if you are already healthy and you eat yogurt regularly, but a lot, then maybe you'll start to see some actual health effects, but there's never been a study that showed, yes, yogurt is such a powerhouse that it can knock out rheumatoid arthritis. Right. And those are kind of the claims that people are making. 
And there's like some, there's some basis, there's some kernel of truth to it. Like one of the big things now with dieting is, um, or not, not dieting, but eating, eating right or eating healthy, I guess, whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it, is this idea that when you eat, your body becomes inflamed as part of the immune response. Like, what did you just eat? What is that? What is that? And it goes in kind of like defense mode to sort things out. Well, the idea is that over time, if you're, if you're eating stuff that sets off your immune response, your inflammatory response, pretty much constantly, that has a terrible effect on your body and can manifest itself in things like inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. So the, the logic is, and they've shown that yes, yogurt can actually possibly maybe reduce your inflammatory response. So it's going from yogurt might be able to lessen your inflammatory response to some really, really bad food to yogurt can cure rheumatoid arthritis. And that's the problem. Yeah, uh, especially in women, uh, it seems to have a little bit better chance at reducing inflammation. Uh, They did this one study at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Go Badgers, right? Wolverines? Boy, I think it's got to be Badgers, right? It is the Badgers. I'm just giving them a hard time. (laughs) I didn't know if that was, yeah, that's Madison, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, We need to do a show there, by the way. We do, or we could just make everybody drive to Milwaukee. It's an hour away. I did like Milwaukee. It was a great show. That was that was a cool town. Mm-hmm. So they did a study where they had 60 women, um, half uh, of whom were obese, and they had them eat 12 ounces of low-fat yogurt every day for nine weeks, then a control group, of course, uh, with eating uh, non-dairy pudding. Mm-hmm. So they have— <laughs> Which is like, what? what is that? <laughs> like snack packs? I don't know. Um, And they measured levels of proteins, uh, it says, excreted by immune cells to determine how much inflammation was in their body. So they're they're trying to measure the uh, uh, inflammatory response that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And they did find that the yogurt uh, yogurt ladies, as they like to be called, Mm -hmm. saw improvements in some markers of inflammation. Mm -hmm. But again, that's, that's a long way from saying it can help your rheumatoid arthritis. Right. That's part of the problem. I think people just want it. It's just such a great idea, this this natural thing that's been with humanity since the dawn of civilization can actually help help cure the, some of these modern ailments from our modern world. People want that to be the truth so bad. I don't see anything wrong with that, but it's 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 not necessarily the case, I think. Yes, and it was also, this uh, study was funded by the National Dairy Council, um, and again, the guy, uh, the the doctor who performed it, of course, he was like, it doesn't matter where the money came from. Same conclusion. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can take him at his word, I guess. I don't, I'm not saying he's like in the pocket of big dairy. <laughs> right. But uh, which we laugh, but I'm sure that's a thing. Well, the I'm National sure Yogurt <laughs> Association, they're the front, they're the, they're the, the leg breakers for the Dairy Association. Uh, but like I said earlier, because there's a lot of protein in yogurt, it will make you feel more full and you might have fewer unhealthy snacks. So it's one of those, you know, things like, is it uh, really making that difference or is this causing you to change patterns? Right. Which is fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Again, there's nobody who's saying, no, eating yogurt's bad for you. You do want to watch it. If you are trying to lose weight, um, eating full-fat yogurt, too much full-fat yogurt, especially if you're eating it in addition to other stuff, Rather than using it to replace something, mm-hmm. you can gain weight. The the um the I think the average weight gain in that one study you were talking about from both the yogurt and the pudding cohorts was like a, a kilogram. I think, yeah, a couple of pounds. Yeah, over like nine weeks or something like that. So that's that's a significant amount of weight gain. But they were eating like twelve ounces. It's two full servings of yogurt every day. That's a um, lot of yogurt. I mean, it's a lot. I like yogurt, but it's not the kind of food you sit down and eat a bowl of, you know? No, uh, no, you definitely you want it in its own little amount. <laughs> it's it's like a grape nuts bowl, you know? Yeah, and for parents, you know, gogurt, uh, not to pick on them, but they definitely market that. I used to do, I did a couple of gogurt commercials back in the day as a PA. Mm, oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, they definitely market towards kids. It's packaged in a little kid friendly, uh, fun way to eat. Um, and we're not saying yogurt's bad for kids, but that stuff is loaded with uh, sugar and calories from sure. sugar. Yeah. So just know that. 
going in. From what I understand, the closest thing to actual yogurt that you can get in the United States is something like Greek yogurt. That's the only kind I eat. I think like, it tastes best. It is. It's fantastic. Like plain Greek yogurt, and then you just add a little honey. Don't forget the honey, Chuck. I, I know. I got I to gotta call my beekeeper. <clears throat> there's also something called, there's bo- traditional Bulgarian yogurt. Bulgaria is very well known for its yogurt love. They have something called Kiselo Milyako, which is, means soured milk. And I just think of Balki Bartakamos saying it. <laughs> Is that his last name? <laughs> yeah. From Perfect Strangers? Yeah, what was it? Balki Bartakamos. 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 I don't think I ever heard that. Yeah. I didn't watch that show, though. Oh, you were missing out. I know. <laughs> the episode where they were moving a piano up, up like a, a couple of flights of stairs. Was that a real episode? Yes, it was, Chuck. And I, am, <laughs> I would put my money on this. It is one of the greatest examples of physical comedy in television history. I mean, that's an old thing. Like Friends had an episode of moving a couch upstairs. These guys make Friends look like piles of walking poop. <laughs> <laughs> that's how good that's how good this perfect strangers episode was. Like Friends doesn't even want to talk about it. Oh man. <laughs> but I mean that's a classic bit like the uh Marx sure. brothers or, you know, probably Harlan Hardy with, or something. Or Buster Keaton probably first came up with it. Yeah, he moved a piano or two in his day. You want to uh talk about the in Soviet Georgia um yogurt? campaign real quick? Yeah, I actually did not get to see that, so you can teach me. Okay, so in 1977, Dannon, who really is almost single-handedly responsible for bringing yogurt and making it popular in America, in, in the 70s, they came out with an ad campaign called In Soviet Georgia, where they went to Georgia, one of the Soviet Union's republics at the time, and found like 100-plus-year-old people who were still vital and active and said, hey, can we film you like bailing hay? And then afterward, you'll eat like a nice cup of Dan and yogurt and people will say, hey, that's great. I want to be bailing hay at 105 like this person. And it was kind of risky at the time because this is the Cold War, the late 70s, the Soviet Union and the United States were not friends. But to advertise to the United States, they sent their ad people to the Soviet Union and it just went off. It was a total hit. Like Dannon, their sales were in the gutter. And all of a sudden, they're just back on top. And it's actually credited with kicking off this, what we think of now is like normal, but the yogurt craze that started in the late 70s, early 80s, and continued on and has finally gotten to the point where we're actually starting to eat healthy yogurt. That was that commercial in Soviet Georgia. Crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. They, they found one guy who was 89, and they said his mother was 114, and they filmed them in one of the commercials. And they said he he ate two cups, and it made his mother very proud, but he's 89. That was the big <laughs> joke. 114, man. Yeah. All from eating yogurt. I need to get on it. You got anything else? If I want to live to be 114. You got to start eating some yogurt, and don't forget the honey. God, could you imagine me at 114? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually, I can now that you mention it. Nobody wants that. I could totally see it. You'd be like, I'm back to the whole pizza and whole thing of ice cream thing. <laughs> so you it. might want to stand back. <laughs> wow, this one had a lot of fart and poop jokes. Yeah, well, it happens. Well, if you want to know more about yogurt, go eat some yogurt. Eat the good stuff. Learn to love it. And your stomach will be happy whether science can prove that it is or not. Uh, and since I said that, it's time for listener mail. All right, I'm going to call this self-professed medievalist. This guy, uh, Stephen Gray, wrote in. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's from Melbourne, Australia, but living in London now. Nice. And he says, I'm writing uh, for some extra info, uh, to give you extra info for uh, the Robin Hood episode. Uh, First of all, Josh talks about uh, Rich slash Johnny Sitch. (laughs) And says that Richard was uh, king of England for two years and that John was the natural heir. Uh, Richie was actually king for ten years that spent only uh, six months of his reign in England. While he was off on the Third Crusade, he left his chancellor, William of Longchamp, as regent, but his brother John was cranky about it and schemed against him, inciting a rebellion. Huh. When Rich eventually got back, he forgave Johnny, named him heir to the throne, so the bad King John, good King Richard bit uh, of the R.H. canon is actually based in fact. Wow, that's interesting. 
Uh, perhaps more interesting, he says, I set up, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when the Robin Hood story started coming out during the reign of Henry III, it was during a period where uh, Henry was waging war for his lands in Gascony, France. Henry was not a very strong-willed or charismatic king, so he didn't get along super well with his nobles, and as a result, to raise funds for the war effort, he had to rely more heavily on his uh, foresters and sheriffs to raise some mega taxes. So the Robin Hood stories pit our hero against these uh, extortionate representatives of a nasty villainous king, but of course, you can't directly suggest that's the current king, so you have to be not so subtle and point to a recent but previous scenario uh, which everyone will draw the parallels from. Wow. This guy's not just a self-proclaimed medievalist. I officially confirm him as a medievalist. <laughs> he says, hopes this helps, uh, hope this helps your insatiable appetite to keep learning, as your podcast does mine. Nice. I love you guys. That is Stephen Gray. Thanks a lot, Stephen. That was a great email. We love you, too. <laughs> Let's hug. Yeah. Hey, you go, Stephen. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us like Stephen did, we want to hear from you. You can go to stuffyoushouldknow.com and find all of our social links there. And you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts my iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs>